Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Dave Mahaley uh, with the Pandemic Educator. Um, I'm going to wait just about 30 seconds or to a minute more, and then we'll get underway. Um, welcome back for those of you who joined us last week, and welcome to those who are new. And hopefully we'll have some, some ideas and some thoughts here that will be useful to you uh, as we work through the current situation uh, and how it connects to education. We'll be back in just about 30 seconds. All right, good afternoon. Welcome everybody. It's uh, just a few minutes there after one o'clock. Thanks for joining us. Maybe it's uh, part of your day that you have a little break around lunch or something like that. But um, we've got, I think, some exciting things to talk about today and especially um, a, a great guest and, and friend of mine who I think will have some great insight to share. Um, thanks again to Steve for uh, putting this together with the Learning Revolution and the opportunity for educators and people from around uh, really the world to be able to connect in and, and talk about some things and get some great ideas. Um, as we roll into the second week of this show, we're going to look really today at how do you take the instructional show online? How do you migrate what you traditionally do? It could be even a blending show or it could be just face to face. How do we take that and get that into the online um, environment and make that a successful learning experience? It's no easy task for sure. And especially if you're new to online learning, it can be a real challenge uh, for, for people. And I'm gonna grab us on to a, a slide here. Um, as I kind of read through reports and I get uh, different, different things sent along my way, um, I think it's interesting to look at where is the United States, where are we, uh, those of us in the US, as compared to other parts of the world, when we start looking being prepared or ready to take things online and have that experience be successful. Um, in this graphic from the National Center on Education and the Economy, we can take a snapshot uh, of, you know, kind of where is the U.S. in comparison to some others. Um, now this, this data, you have to look at it in terms of, you know, what does it reflect? Um, does it reflect the confidence level of the teachers? Well, maybe the actual ability of, of teachers, having the right tools available to be able to teach online. Again, it's survey data, uh, which always must be reviewed kind of in the context uh, from which it originates. In this case, being a geographer like myself, I would want to know a bit more about the education systems, the countries reflected here, uh, socioeconomics, how things were set up originally with the education system and how technology played a role in that. Um, because all that can impact how these figures sort of are, are produced. Um, at any rate, maybe we can give the U.S. really a safe sort of average grade on readiness. Um, and in my sort of travels around and, and going around to different schools, I, I see some that are really prepared, in fact, completely online, uh, to some that, that really haven't been able to make that transition for a variety of, of different reasons. Um, for some, some points of, of emphasis this week, um, I, I wanna focus on really, when we take the show online, uh, you know, coming, coming from me, what are some, some really key things to take into account and to consider when you're doing this? And so I've kind of narrowed this down to, to four areas looking at, um, you know, what, what we can do. Um, 
and I want to emphasize uh, that, that these are kind of strategies and, and hopefully to build a little confidence both, both with the teachers as well as the learner. Now on the screen you see there she is Miss you know, Madeline Hunter uh, circa 1970s or so uh, and, and what would Madeline do? I mean if she was around and, and you know if you've been in education a while you always heard seven step lesson plan and so forth and um, certainly she would have a feeling and, and you know an idea but unfortunately she can't be a guest on the show but we can uh, use kind of the foundational work of the seven step lesson plan from many years ago to start looking at how do we take that model, one probably you've used face to face teaching if you've been around doing this for a little while and apply it to online learning. I think that if you have a reliable teaching model, model that you use, then there's usually a great way once you think about it a bit to kind of transition that to an online learning environment. Take a minute to think about your own way of teaching and, and let's, let's explore these four areas and, and we'll explore home base. What, what do I mean by that? And then a learning library and then connecting out through media and then looking at communication. Let's first take a look at this idea of home base. Now, this could look very familiar to some of you um, because we talk about things like learning management systems or LMS. Um, they're really born out of the need to have teaching and learning materials centralized in a location that was easily accessed and included learning tools to allow the traditional instruction to kind of go to a new virtual world. For some of you, an LMS has been given to you by your institution. Say, so here you go, uh, put your course in a box and, and you can start to use it. Um, or perhaps you use one to connect your learners in your own individual courses and learning activities. If you don't have one of these, I would encourage you to look into it. Um, there, there are all varieties out there, but the good news is that many that were paid or, or had just sort of a paid tier, they, they're offering some free level at this point. And even as an individual instructor, instructor, if you need to get something online, there's a lot of those that, that really have opened the door and allowed that to happen. Um, the importance of developing your home base is that this becomes the learning center, the teaching center uh, for your instruction gives you a place to house, whether you're using Google Classroom, Canvas, Moodle, Weebly, all of these, and the list goes on and on. Um, it allows you to place your content somewhere where you can use to teach with and the learner can access to learn with. Um, and I, I would encourage you to, to look at that home base approach. Where are you gonna center this teaching and learning uh, for your course? The second item that I think is important to look at is this idea of a learning library. As you go through this, and, and I'm very guilty of this as well. You get long bookmark lists and, and you know, as the years go by, you think, God, there was this really good site two years ago that I wanted to use today. And you're trying to go back and find that. Um, there's so many resources available online for educators. Uh, this, this really could be resources that are paid or subscription-based models that are out there to free and open resources with the OERs and things like that. Um, it can be very overwhelming if someone's turned loose to find your own curriculum resources in order to create a, a learning experience. Um, several conversations I've had with educators like, yes, we're supposed to go online. What do I teach with? Um, and that's, that's a, a big hurdle. And it can be overwhelming if you start searching any particular topic and up comes this list of 55 things you could use today for your course. Where do you start? Um, so it is important to understand that as you look for ways to engage your learners beyond the video lecture or static text resources, you'll do yourself a real favor if you have a way to organize these elements into one location. That is taking links to those interactive labs you run across, those simulations, research portals, other good resources, putting them somewhere where you can quickly index those and find them. So this is where my idea of a learning library comes from. Now it could be housed in a learning management system or Symbaloo or somewhere else that you could just store these items. Um, so, so many of us use Google and I would start uh, by kind of encouraging people to look at Google Keep as a way to sort of store and retrieve these things. Um, uh, Google Keep really just gives you a few quick steps to be able to put these things uh, into one location that's tied into your Google Drive. You can share these with other educators, with other people you're working with, and you can tag things and search for them and it just it puts all of that in one location to help you organize your resources. Perhaps you want to put them in, in certain sorts of topic uh, headings. Uh, you could easily do that. Um, 
there's a lot of resources we'll talk about today. And just as a reminder, um, at the very end, again, uh, at the URL for the web page I've set up, I'll have links to all of these uh, for you to be able to jump on and take a look at yourself a little bit further. Um, but the bottom line here is explore a way to save your great finds, okay? Uh, take time to organize them because this time will be saved when it comes to the point where you need them and you can find them quickly and easily. The third thing is, is really to uh, connect through media. Um, sometimes this is done in a traditional classroom. I mean, you can have someone who stands and lectures for 50 minutes, I suppose, uh, but a lot of times people are adding in things like PowerPoints, presentations, um, along with their learning. Um, but I, I, would, I would tell you, take a look at how can I use media now that we're completely online to help give that visual or, or that, that sound or audio piece that would help them learn and understand the context, context better. Um, the old phrase, pick up a book and look, learn something, has a lot of truth in it in terms of being able to read and discover new, new things. As we move this teaching online, text is necessary and it's a part uh, of providing that information to students, but we must also take time to discover how other media formats can really engage our learners more completely um, within the context of the lesson. Um, I find, uh, you know, working with educators and course designers that this is often a real skill hurdle. How do I go about making a graphic? How do I get these interactive simulations happening? What about a video? How do I make my video engaging for the learners? Um, I mean, thousands of educators in the past weeks have all of a sudden become the, you know, online video, you know, lecture expert, and here they come. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a, a wide range of, of quality out there in some of this, and, and it takes a lot of skill and practice to, to get well, at, you know, get really good at it. And um, I, I think with time being so short and being pressed into this, some people are on that learning curve. And I say baby steps, utilize media galleries. There's lots of audio, sound, image files, uh, video segments and things that can be integrated uh, that are quite useful. Um, and I would also encourage people to set some foundational knowledge about what rich media really is. Now, Steve Covello um, has done some great work and he actually provides a guide for this, uh, for, for instructors in teaching with rich media. Um, and really this book addresses the issue. Um, and, and in this case, here's a quote from the website I, I took down, is online instructors need a framework for teaching beyond text using rich media as instructional resource. These include multimedia, social media, and cloud-based web tools. This book defines rich media, its affordances, its value in conveying information, a model for pedagogical strategies, and a set of instructor competencies, and two models for assessment for use in professional development. So it's a real complete package. Um, again, I've got this, you can search for it. I've also got a link to it um, in the resources. And again, he makes it available through the Creative Commons, which is great. Um, so you can grab it as a PDF form. You can share with people. Uh, it, it's a pretty quick read, but has some valuable insight into how to integrate these media components into what you're doing um, with your particular course. Uh, and at the end of the day, from what Cavello uh, is, 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 uh, says in his own words, that it's helping to address this relatively large gap in evidence-based practice for teaching online as a profession due to the newness. And, and it, it is new and maybe real new to a larger segment of the teaching population than it was say six months ago, for sure. The uh, third thing or the, the next thing here that I want, really the last of these is looking at communication. Um, and this is, very important to me and kind of near and dear because I see things happening um, around me. I read about them and, and some of the, the errors in, in communication can really impact the experience that, that both the instructor and the learners and the people supporting them have. Um, and I would say that through my review, looking at communication to learners from schools and districts, teachers, others, um, they're really focusing on things, you hear the words compassion, flexibility, understanding, supportive, and positive. And, and these really should be the lens from which we craft our messages uh, to, to help them have some sense of normalcy during a highly unusual situation. Beyond those themes and, and, and good strategies to start kind of crafting things from, 
Um, I think there's a, a couple other things, and I list these at the top. We're looking at really succinct. Um, please don't write out, you know, uh, 10 paragraph emails about all the do's and don'ts of what someone should be doing while they're, they're learning from home. Keep it simple. Pause for a, ma a minute and just ask yourself what really matters. Incredibly important. Sometimes people get into a discussion about how should we do this and you know, they haven't stepped back and said, does that really matter in this situation? And schools face that all the time. Things like, uh, one topic's come up is things like attendance. How do we mark attendance? How, well, maybe, does that really matter? It does or doesn't. I mean, I think those are initial questions you have to ask. Um, another thing is, is really clarity of vision. And what do you want the experience to be like for learners and their support structure? Communicate this de uh, de in detail and clearly and repeatedly because people need to know that mission because that gives them the foundation from which everything else should come from. It's, it's setting the tone, it's setting the expectations, and it avoids kind of the negative do's and don'ts rule list that, that can come. It really turns things around in a positive. How do we want this experience to be for you? And here's what we're going to do to make it that way. Um, things can happen like setting a weekly message, uh, doing kind of a brief, quick in, in, information session, could be, be online even. Um, I would tell instructors to start and end your lessons the same way, to structure the flow of learning. Um, really make it consistent in this very different uh, framework that, that you're operating in as much as possible. Gives the learners comfort, knowing kind of what to expect each day. So I would tell you, take a little bit of time just to ponder those ideas as you're approaching this. And most people are up and running with this at the moment, but maybe some food for thought as you, you begin to refine and perfect what you're doing and offering to people online. Um, I, I want to kind of move on to, uh, well, what I've been looking for today myself really is an opportunity for uh, Kelly and I to, to have some conversations, share with uh, everyone there um, about education and technology. Um, Kelly Walsh is, is CIO and, and CISO, uh, an assistant press, uh, professor at the College of Westchester in White Plains, New York. Um, and Kelly's done a lot of things, namely uh, one thing I've been really connected with is emerging ed tech. Um, he, he has, uh, well, run that as long as I've known him, so a uh, good, good long while. Great resource for educators, anybody in, in teaching and learning and using technology, some, some great tools coming through there when he sends out the newsletters and so forth. Um, he does a lot of speaking. He does a lot of articles and authoring of things for um, higher ed, for business and education, um, as well as maintaining his very personal uh, endeavor there with Emerging Ed Tech. Um, and I'd like to, to welcome him and thank you, Kelly, for, for being a part of what we're going to discuss today. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dave. I'm really glad to uh, be able to have this conversation and to hopefully uh, add on to the great insights and tips and ideas that you've uh, presented already. Well, that, uh, that's great. I, I, I mean, I really like Emerging Ed Tech. I've always really enjoyed being able to see the variety of content you have there. And, and I, so I wanted you to give, uh, give the rest of the listeners just a few minutes sort of overview of, you know, what are you trying to do with that site? What do you hope people get out of that site? And, and as you look towards the future, what do you, what do you want to do with that? Uh, sure, so um, when I came to education in 2008, uh, I was not in education prior. I had been, a, I've always been an IT manager for a long time. But I felt when I got to higher ed that I really landed in an industry I, I cared about. And it was a fascinating time, particularly in terms of technology. So around 2008, the whole social media thing was becoming very real. You're really starting to see that this is going to have an impact. And blogging had become a thing. And um, I like to write. <clears throat> and I said, you know what? Let's give this a shot. I hopped on Blogger, started writing a little bit about instructional technology. And, and that's part of the fun of it is that all these things, right, liking to write, being interested in learning about what's happening with um, technology, particularly in the instructional environment, um, plus this explosion of social media, all kind of came together. And it was a lot of fun. I found very quickly that it was a way to share ideas and to connect. Um, I think we're both big fans of the, you know, the personal learning network. We can learn so much from each other. And the digital world has just, uh, you know, exploded that idea. Um, 
And then it quickly became a way to share useful information and to learn from others. And that was so much fun when I can, uh, you know, when an educator comes back to me and says, hey, that's a great tool. Thanks for helping me learn about it or, you know, learning how to, to leverage it in a positive way. Um, it, it's really nice. It feels great to help people learn that way. Uh, it also evolved over the years into a great opportunity to let other writers have a place to post their material. So I get a bit inundated with uh, requests to guest post, and I try and maintain the quality of the site and really look for people who understand education and the needs of educators. But then it's great when I can let somebody, you know, have an audience and have a platform. Um, so, you know, it's just over the years, and I can't believe it's been uh, about 11 years since I formally established the brand. Um, it's allowed me that just, allowed me that just, oh, what was that? Somebody was breaking up a little. What was that? Somebody was breaking up a little. So it allowed me to branch out in so many different ways. So many different ways. It, are you still hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. You just said it seemed a little off for a minute, so. Yeah, I was getting a bit of an echo there. Um, but, you know, as you know, you and I can make a you know, you you know, know, conference so long ago, largely because of work on American Tech. And then I, I've had more and more of these opportunities over the year. So I just continue to look at it as a way to offer resources to educators and to, um, and to connect with other educators and just look for opportunities for me to learn and to help others learn. Well, very good. Very good. Um, I've got a few little questions and, and topics I'd like for us to, to talk about. Um, and... My, my computer's a little bit slow at the moment, but hopefully you can, can you still hear me okay? I can, you're breaking up a little okay. bit. Break up a little bit. Okay, um, well, if you can hear me, I, I wanna kind of get into a couple of the questions. And uh, a lot of your work is in the area of higher ed. Um, and I'd like to know a little bit about your situation there at the university and, and uh, you know, what had to be done to quickly move your faculty and students to that uh, exclusively online format. Sure. So, um, you sure. know, we were fortunate in that we were uh, well prepared in some regards. Higher ed had a big advantage over K twelve in the sense that, um, yeah, I'm uh, looking in the chat and hearing an echo. So I don't know if anybody else out there had um, that might help with that. Um, so higher ed had the advantage, and you were talking earlier about the LMS and. Many higher ed institutions already have some online programs, and that's a really gave us, you know, we had the tools and we had people with experience, and in many cases, we had many courses that were built out. And that was something that was great to take advantage of. So, for the traditional day teacher, um, you know, teaching the traditional age student and used to mostly lecturing. They had, you know, they had resources they need. They had people who could help them learn how to use these tools quickly. Um, they might even be able to tap into existing course content used in some of the online courses. Um, and that was huge. So having those resources was a big difference. Um, another thing that really made a big difference was we started talking and planning and thinking about this very early on. And a lot of credit goes to uh, our president, um, Del Balzo, and a lot of other folks. Uh, it was, you know, super early in March that we said, hey, this could be real and we need to start thinking and preparing. So that helped to make a big difference. Um, another thing we had going for us too is our adult program in the evening is a hybrid program in which about two thirds of the content is delivered uh, in person and about a third remotely. So those teachers and those students, again, already had some experience with this online environment. Uh, um, another uh, thing that made a huge difference was standardizing. Um, so, you know, as soon as this happened, and I know a lot of educators are still um, struggling with this now, there's so many tools. And if, you know, one teacher is using one tool in one course and another teacher is using another tool in another course uh, and so on, it can become very confusing to the student, um, challenging to support from the IT folks trying to lend support, challenging for other educators to learn. So, you know, we, we had our LMS that was in place and there was no changing that. Um, but then in terms of tools like a Zoom for remote access, we've been a Zoom customer since uh, a, a long time. I think we were one of the first higher education customers. And, you know, we said, this is what we're using. Don't start going off to go to meeting or, you know, a Google platform or something else. Let's use this tool. So 
So that was another uh, factor that really helped out. And then leadership. Leadership was just tremendous. Um, you know, having people step up quickly, get people communicating, um, define, you know, give some structure to uh, what the suggested approach is, especially for those who were very new to this environment. Uh, that was another thing that really played a key role in helping to um, get it going quickly. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm having to try something on my computer here to see if I can help out a little bit. Um, I, when, when you're looking at um, the activities that leaders in education can do to support their staff and students and kind of the extended learning community, um, what do you see are the most important things to really emphasize when you're trying to help someone understand, hey, what, what should you be doing to help make this be a successful experience uh, at, in your role? Sure. Um, there's so much that leadership can do to really make a difference. Uh, it starts with that, that top-down, um, you know, getting people together, getting people talking, having consistent dialogue, uh, and uh, that's where you set the stage so that people are surfacing their struggles and their ideas and their thoughts, and then hopefully as a group, people are working together to say, hey, let's be consistent in our approach. Um, and I think that's really a, a tremendous part of where this whole thing starts. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, refocusing priorities where you need to. Um, we're, we're in a quickly changing situation, so you need to kind of balance uh, flexibility with keeping things moving forward, but also knowing you, you may need to take different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The other thing too is, uh, you, you, you know, as we think forward, we need to probably have a couple of different plans for how we might approach things. So, you know, sort of the plan A, plan B, plan C approach where we're needed as we're thinking about um, changing needs and how those are going to happen. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it ultimately it comes back to the student, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, running my IT shop, we've always had this sort of mantra that says, listen, students are the top priority and then faculty right behind them and then staff yeah. last. So helping students and helping staff work through this is so important. Um, lending an ear, giving them the opportunity to, to voice their concerns and frustrations and challenges, um, making sure they know that you're there to help, you're there to figure out creative solutions. Um, we have you know, with the building closed and people needing things from time to time, we've really had to put a lot of effort into thinking, how do we do that? How do we accommodate people's needs? Um, it's not a time to get ridiculously rigid and just say, no, no, no. We have to find a way to yes, to, uh, to help people while still maintaining, um, you know, the focus on health and, 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 you know, being, having the appropriate cautions in place. Um, one of the things we did too uh, that was uh, been, been hugely helpful is we surveyed our students. Now, you know, we have the advantage of being a small institution and I, I could hardly imagine the challenge if you're a 10, 20,000 uh, student university. Um, we're much smaller than that and we know our students well. And we surveyed them to ask what, you know, how are you doing? How are you making that out there? What are your challenges? What kind of help do you need? Um, a, a, as well as taking their pulse on their personal experience. Um, we're, uh, we're in White Plains, New York, right outside of New York City, and it's, it's rough. Um, you know, we serve an underserved demographic. Uh, a lot of our students have lost their jobs. A lot of st our students have lost family members. Um, so it's a tough time, but we're going student by student, and we're following back up with them to see what we can do to help them. Um, you know, we're extending deadlines. We're, we're pushing back the next start of courses. Um, so, you know, that's been really, really important. And uh, it's one of the real blessings of being a smaller institution that we can bring a very focused and personalized approach to, uh, to helping our students and to understanding their challenges and addressing them. Yeah, I think um, certainly where you're, at, where you're at in New York, I mean, they, there's been a real struggle uh, with the current situation and, and of course just in education in general with, with serving a, a group of students and trying to be quick and agile enough to be able to address those needs. Yep. Um, there's another topic that I know you're very passionate about. You've done a lot of work with this really is, is uh, the, the world of flipped learning. Um, and 
you know, as we, we experience things, people, so many people going online, and while just teaching online is not necessarily the definition of flipped learning, um, I do think there's a lot of, of what flipped learning requires out of uh, educators that could be transferred into good practice if taking your teaching online. Give us a couple ideas about how you, how you see that transition and where the role of flipped learning could play in that. Well, absolutely. So, you know, just to, to kind of recap flipped learning, um, in the simplest sense, the idea is take what, you know, used to be homework. So, you know, think of uh, a typical maybe a middle school, high school math class where the students sit and um, how well they pay attention is, uh, you know, varies widely from student to student. And uh, then they go home and they've got these challenging problems to work through. And for whatever reason, they may be, you know, somewhat clueless or just struggling with it. And that model's a little, um, there's, a, there's a different approach. And that's what, uh, you know, John, uh, John Bergman and Aaron Sams back in the late 2000s, um, along with others, because this kind of sprang somewhat organically from the fact that we had tools like YouTube available. Um, they said, you know what, why don't we flip it up a little bit rather than f using all that valuable face-to-face -face time in the class, um, chewing it up just by delivering content. Um, why don't we use that time to help students where they need help? But that meant take the lecture, take the content and push it outside of the classroom. <coughs> so that was kind of the fundamental of where this came from. And um, there's a lot of subtleties to it and to how to do it well. Uh, but in the end, really, it's just kind of a form of blended learning and you know, the world is increasingly blended because of the, the growth of digital. And now, uh, you know, you and I were talking earlier about all of a sudden it's pedal to the metal. Um, everybody's really figuring out how to, how to move content online. So certainly those techniques in flip learning, the idea of creating small video snippets, you don't have to create them all yourself. There's a lot of ways, and you were talking about that earlier in your content, lots of media to tap into, but ways to create learning content and resources that you use in more of a homework style capacity. Consume these things before class, and then ideally maybe even have a little um, assignment. It could be a quiz. Uh, there's a great technique I like called the, the whisk, watch, summarize, and ask a question. So maybe you give them a short video, you say, give me a paragraph on what you watched, and ask a smart question related to the material, which really gets them to think, and can also start to unearth misunderstandings. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can have them consume the content, get feedback to help you understand how well are they understanding this. Um, and then when you have your class time together through, you know, through Zoom or some online um, interactive uh, tool, you can begin to explore those, you know, how well do they understand it? How can we, you know, what do we need to focus a little deeper on? And how can we work through problems online to give them a better, a better understanding while you're there to help? And if you're using a tool like Zoom, they've got great little um, applets like these break rooms where you can have, uh, let students work together in small groups online. So a lot of those techniques really lend themselves to this situation and to figuring out how to uh, move or improve uh, remote teaching. Very good. Um, last uh, big question for you and, and trying to uh, sort of narrow this down to, you know, here, here's, Kelly Walsh's book of advice uh, for taking your lessons online. Um, what would what someone, you know, if somebody were to call you up today and say, okay, Kelly, what do I do? Give me some advice here. Um, what would you narrow that down to right away? Well, you know, my advice would be a lot more about uh, not the technology, but the, the technique and just some ideas. And I think you hit on some of these as well and what you were talking about earlier. Um, I, and I do, I teach, I've taught uh, in all three modalities in, in my school. So I've taught ground, I've taught in our hybrid adult programs, and I've taught online. And online in, in particular is an area where I've always been concerned about quality. Um, and so some things that are really important. One is presence. You have to be as present as you can in the class. Um, I'm a big believer in video. It's a great technique to do that. I do a short video introduction um, where I talk to the students uh, at the beginning of each week in our online courses in this remote teaching scenario for the students to see you, to hear you, to hear your voice. Um, I think it makes a really big difference in terms of their experience uh, and how they feel about it. Um, 
the other thing to keep in mind too is a uh, the Lord knows what the numbers are because you'll you can talk to different linguists and people and you'll get a whole range of answers but some big percentage of communication is body English um, so that's also an element so having an online you know your presence as an instructor in your remote teaching is tremendously important and and so you know if you're just setting home packets of worksheets and there's not much dialogue happening that's that's unfortunate and it's probably not the best um, situation for the students so that's huge presence uh, another thing that is just absolutely vital is feedback students have got to get constant feedback on the work that they're doing um, you know, I've, I've seen, I've experienced situations where students that I've known uh, in, you know, my own kids in their college experiences, for example, are, you know, taking more remote or online types of instruction and getting, you know, they're weeks in and they really don't know where their grades are. They're really not getting responses from teachers and it's really, really frustrating. Um, and, you know, for me as the parent, let alone for them as the student. So it's just so important that you know, students get feedback on assignments. How are they doing? What can they do better? Um, and knowing that they get the feedback, because I've seen that kind of misunderstanding too well, where instructors are assuming, hey, oh, I typed these comments in this place. I'm sure the, the, teacher, the students must see them. Well, ask them, um, you know, are you getting the feedback that I'm submitting through the assignment portal in the LMS or wherever it might be? Don't just assume that they're seeing it. Um, and we also know that students and to some extent the younger they are the less likely they may be checking email and those kinds of things so you know close the loop on the feedback don't just give the feedback but close the loop and make sure that they're they're getting it so um that's a real big one all right presence feedback let them know their grades i mean this is kind of an extension of the uh the feedback idea but um, it's really important, and, and this may be a bigger issue in higher ed. Certainly, the, the higher up your 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 teaching at, um, you know, uh, the more important it's going to be. Uh, but let them know their grades. You know, where do I stand exactly? What am I? Are my grades on my different assignments? Did I miss anything? Um, I really go out of my way to shove that in front of students um, because very often it's, oh wait, I thought I did that. Oh, let me go find it and get it to you, or I didn't do it and it's not a big deal to get done. Um, so those are three real big ones. In fact, in my little notes, I have those in caps because they're, they're really important. But, you know, some other things, uh, this is just such an unusual time. And we've got to be understanding. We've got to be flexible. Um, it's not the time to get, you know, super rigid. Uh, and um, granted, there are rules and regulations and such that impact what we can and can't do. But thankfully, a lot of that stuff has been relaxed. And it's important to think about that. You know, a lot of students are suffering, even even those who you know their parents are working and everybody's healthy um this is an awkward difficult weird time right and if you're a teenager a young adolescent um it's it's a struggling time so you know we're trying institutionally we occasionally put out uh you know resources to help deal with stress meditations um you know just it's really important to be cognizant of that um and the last thing i'd throw in on that is it's also unique, uh, and, and you have a quote, you had a quote right uh, in the bottom right corner of your first slide about this is an opportunity in a way. And one area in particular where that happens is that, um, I'm seeing a note that my video stopped. Let me see what's going on here. Oh, we got me again? Now you're muted, Dave, but hopefully uh, uh, I'm, I'm on again. Um, so I was just saying that this is also an opportunity. And one way that's an opportunity is that when everybody's participating in a digital way, uh, it can change the dynamic. It can be a little less of those students who always raise their hands and a little more of those students who are very reluctant to, uh, to weigh in. And all of a sudden now they start, you know, they're more willing to come out of their shell. So that's just one last little piece of a, a way to kind of take advantage of the situation and make the most of it. Very good. Uh, thanks for those pointers. I think that's uh, some valuable things to look at, especially that feedback portion. I think um, okay. you don't see people face to face. Uh, you still need to be able to have those conversations and share that that with them. I think is is good. Um, and Kelly, if you hang out for just a bit, we're going to come back to you and, and just open up the floor for some Q and A. If you have some questions for Kelly or so forth, you can type them in the chat window. We'll come back around to that. I'm gonna share just a couple of things related to some recent observations really over the past weeks and things I've run across. 
that um, might be worth you, you taking a look at and, and uh, seeing, seeing what it means to you. Um, the first one I call is the pretty plan. Um, you know, people have good ideas and, and I guess I always look at things at a very practical level. Um, in, in the past week, I, I read a post by Brian Setzer uh, on LinkedIn that offered a critique of a proposed four phase plan to bring school systems up to par with an online format. Um, I mean, it's worth a, a detailed read. He's, he's borrowed this graphic from a site that proposed it. And um, what really struck me when I, at my first review was, okay, this seems kind of logical. Um, but then I started to put my kind of lens of, of pract practicalness uh, or uh, just kind of, okay, is this real? Is this really going to work? Um, and, and I read Brian's analysis of this and it, and it was kind of uh, along the same lines I would tend to look at things. Um, the, the new format of learning is a, be a big leap really for some of these school systems. And um, under uh, phase two, I've highlighted one little piece about rapid teacher training. Um, I, I don't know, I, rapid to me uh, is, is kind of meaning that it's, it's fast, it's not very deep, and it's, it's just, okay, are they gonna get enough information maybe just to be dangerous with, with the tool I've just showed them? Um, and I just think that's a kind of a, a reactionary phrase and, and sort of incomplete. And maybe this would be a little bit of, of an area for confusion. Um, the, in my work, the first question I really ask teachers when they're wanting to do something like this, to move online, is what do you use with your students now? What do they already know how to use? What do you already know how to use well? And in terms of technology, really, let's start simple. Establish that home base. Where are you going to work from? And where are they accessing to? Um, and avoid this, I want to introduce, introduce a whole new slew of, of, of new tools, new models, new things we need to use in the classroom. Um, and I, I put a link in reference to this. It's worth a read. It's, it's kind of a nice analysis of this. And uh, in your respective areas, I know people have pushed out plans. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, and, and I think, again, stepping back, looking at that, is, is this real? Phase four, Kind of seems a little bit of pie in the sky for a lot of people um, and, and certainly not something that I think we're going to roll around the next two weeks to getting to some of those things uh, real effectively. Um, so looking at those pretty plans, um, make sure they're also a practical plan. The next one is really to think like the learner. Um, I use this phrase quite a bit when and in instructional design when you're putting things together you often have to put yourself in the shoe of the learner. Um, and what this does is you begin to anticipate where issues can arise. You inherently start to find ways to be more clear about that learning and the process involved. Uh, embedding things, self-help pieces so that people can find out answers on their own without having to, to go very far away. Um, and, and giving them sort of multiple av avenues for success in what you're asking them to do. Uh, key to all this really is support group for the learners. Um, and, and this could be as, as the ages go down all the way down into, you know, five-year-olds in kindergarten, the support you need all the way through adults is, is very different. Um, but making sure those support individuals have the tools they need to help out at home with completing some of these things, I, I think is important. Um, the last thing that I put there, what to turn in, you might think, oh, that's odd, but uh, I, I helped to manage a learning management system uh, for a school system and I always encourage people, hey, at the end of your assignment, after you've given them all the direction, put in great big bold letters what to turn in and just restate exactly what, you're, what you want. But sometimes they'll read through all the directions, they start working away on something and lo and behold, they turn in something that's not at all what you were expecting. Um, so I say, hey, the last thing should always say what to turn in and tell them what that needs to be. I think that's sort of uh, uh, important. The, the last thing I'll sh share here before we get to um, some Q&A uh, with Kelly and so forth is um, looking at this idea, you know, Kelly remembers from the days of, of doing some iPad conferences together and, and when they first come on the scene, and even today, you, you get this top 10 list of I iPad apps. Here's my top 10 list of whatever. Um, and in fact, I've been asked those questions before. Hey, what's your top five things I should put on my iPad to teach with? I'm kind of like, hmm, well, 
let's think about your situation in context a little bit. So uh, sorry to say, I don't really have one for this. Um, uh, plenty of other people I'm sure have generated these off. I, I've seen a few of them, um, but I think mine are more like common sense uh, items for stakeholders in this situation to really take to heart. Um, with the leaders, communicate that vision. Uh, decide you know, from, the, from the big picture, what, is, what matters and what really doesn't matter. Give multi-levels of support, um, both sort of self-help all the way to in-person as instructors may need that. And be flexible. Some people are gonna have a little harder time transitioning than others. Some teachers connect with me much more than others because they need a little more hand-holding and learning some of the things they have to do to make this work. For instructors, really keep it simple and collaborate with your, your peers, collaborate with others who teach uh, like grade levels, age groups, subject areas, and, and share those resources back and forth. Develop a pattern. Like I said before, start class, end class. Similarly, if you can, I think it, it gives sort of the package of beginning and end that can really help in the online environment. Uh, reasonable expe expectations. Um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion and it's interesting to watch over the past month how things have, oh, we're gonna offer online and they're gonna, they're gonna you know, log in and they're gonna be connected via Zoom or whatever for the same hours that they were sitting at school for those exact same hours through the day. And as people began to sort of process that, more and more I think people have moved away from that just a bit because they understand that the reality of that being able to happen is maybe not, not there. Um, and again, be flexible. That's a sort of recurring theme there. For the learners and support people uh, who, who can help them out, um, they encourage them to talk about what has being what needs to be done. Um, any parents I've talked to, I say, you know, just sit down and go through what they're being asked to do that day with them. Say, okay, what do you have to do here? Tell me what you have to do here, because it can help them understand better what 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 do they have to do, what to turn in, what do they have to finish up at the end of the day with, um, and communicate with their when there's issues send an email to that teacher, reach out to that instructor, uh, reach, in, reach out to that administrator or, or people in the support structure for, for technical difficulties to make things go a little bit smoother. And I always tell them, make a personal schedule. Um, don't, I, I mean, you need to get up and, and have a time you work on things and, and just schedule out your day. Um, because one of the irregularities here is that we've stripped away, especially for the younger people, uh, stripped away their, their normalcy of, this is what I do on Monday through Friday. And a lot of that has gone away. And so now that structure is gone. And I think it's important for us to encourage them to replace that with something that's gonna be comparable or, or you know, something that can support their learning overall. Um, those are kind of my, my observations, a couple of things. And again, um, there'll be some links and so forth. Uh, they're going in, my, my helpful assistant, my, my wife, uh, is um, putting things into the chat window there for you for, to, to link into. And they'll also be on the um, resources page, uh, which um, I have here on this, the slide here. If you have some questions, um, I know that uh, I need to probably catch up a little bit on a few thing there, things there on the chat window to kind of scroll through. But any questions you have for Kelly or I, and um, we, we certainly can, can answer those. Uh, before we get started with that, I'll just let you know, again, doing this weekly, so next week at one o'clock, um, I'm gonna do, do one called really falling through the virtual crack. Uh, and, I think I'd like to focus a little bit on the students and, and how do we keep them from falling through the cracks in this time of online learning where so many of them are used to coming to a location to conduct their learning. How do we make sure they're not falling by the wayside and, and becoming really non-participants in, in this new form uh, format of learning? A um, couple of things here in the chat window. Let's see, I've got um, Bob put in there, when you factor in how much time is spent just moving between locations on lunchtime in the classroom and so forth, um, there's often less than three hours of instruction time in a six hour school day. Absolutely. Uh, That's one of the things, um, transition times in schools, when I used to have to make school schedules when I was running a school, uh, you, you, know, you start saying, well, there's you know, 11 minutes of transition time during the day, 11 times, you know, 180 school days or whatever, you, you really start to add up uh, quite, a, quite a, a bit of time. 
So maybe this offers a bit of an opportunity to become more efficient with the learning and there's not that much uh, time in between. Um, I think the physical movement can be helpful. I mean, we certainly need to incorporate that maybe a little bit more purposefully and, and goal oriented, um, but uh, I think that's a good point. Um, Kelly, you have anything to, to jump in with that? Sure. Um, yeah, just one thing, just right on what you just said there, right? That the brain learns better. Science shows that the brain learns better when, we're, when we get some movement incorporated in what we do. And uh, that's, uh, you know, now we're going backwards in that regard, right? Because most of us don't have to move as much if we're sitting in front of the computer doing this. So it's important for people to make uh, a point of doing that. And, and some leadership from educators in that regard would be helpful. Make sure your students are getting up and stretching and moving around a bit if they can. Um, you know, a, as you were talking, I mean, two particular challenges I've seen that are interesting. One is this thing of, do we try, you know, how much do we try and run our sessions at the same time that they ran during the day? And it, it's definitely, a, a, it, it, there's, there, there's not a super easy answer um, and flexibility is required. Uh, on the one hand, our experience has been the more we can do that, the more advantage it brings in the sense that First of all, we're less likely to step on each other, right? If somebody randomly decides to move their stuff, well then what happens to the other person who's running their session at that time? Because that's when it was scheduled. Um, I think it's good for the, for the students. It, it emulates that structure they're used to. Um, but the reality of it is because of changed circum circumstances, not everybody can um, necessarily easily make those same times. I and mean, we've got a lot of students, even traditional age students who are, you know, they're, they're helping to watch their kids, they're helping to take care of a sick one, they're, they're out working because mom or dad lost a job. So um, it's, it's tough, you know, that, that, that balance. Um, anyway, the other thing that came to mind that did not come up, but that is a challenge I think everybody's facing, and I'd be curious to hear from others on it, is uh, technology. You know, now all of a sudden you've got people at home and maybe there's only one, one or two computers in the house and four people need to use them. Um, and it's just not, you know, it, there wasn't such a crunch on that resource before. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that. And um, I'm, you know, I'm curious to, to know how people are dealing with it. We've been trying to provide loaners to students where we can, um, but that's been a funky challenge. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's right on because um, I know there's situations where you have families at home and you've got uh, the adults perhaps trying to connect in virtually themselves. You've got kids trying to navigate maybe a whole list of, of different websites or video feeds or things um, and, and that whole point of, of access and how to do that. I think that's what really has driven a lot of people to a decision, at least in K-12 for sure, is to say, you know what, um, we're going to give you some assignments and you can work on these and I'll be available from this time to this time online if you need to talk to me live about it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, here's my recorded content, here's the resources, here's the activities I want you to complete. Comes, comes back to that bit of flexibility I think you have to show um, because then you, you would run into a situation where people would kind of overlap and, and what do I do when? Um, I know with, with my son who's, who's in college right now, maintaining that regular, uh, from, from what he told me, he said, well, we don't have class every day that we're meeting up together, but there are certain days of the week that he wants us to connect in and, and we're doing a, a, a group class. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's been a little bit of a blend of things. Um, and, you know, the level of help, one of the things I'm really concerned about is, is on, on two ends of the spectrum. One is a five-year-old, a six-year-old is going to need a lot of assistance perhaps with some work and some things they're doing in the classroom. Just like if you know, my, my daughter took uh, calculus AB or, or something like that, <laughs> I'm not a math person mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at home and she's opening a book and she's asking me questions, I, you know, I'm not going to be much of a resource to her. So mm -hmm. I think at both ends of that spectrum, you, you've got uh, some real challenges going on in the house. Um, Kids, kids in general are pretty good at reaching out, I think, mainly to their peers or, or other things like that, um, which I think you can leverage that at times uh, in your class to, to help one make those connections, keep those connections within the classroom, uh, but also allow them a level of self-help that's not always just the instructor too. Sure. Yeah, definitely an unprecedented situation, huh? Yes. 
Uh, Stephanie, um, uh, good to see you back. And uh, she says, I totally agree that our sedentary society has uh, big concerns here now that this is new online normal. Um, it is the place of the school to set a new tone for, for movement, holistic balance, and individual development. Hours suggested to sit and be online, indoors versus outdoors and active, not just academic concerns, but social, physical, et cetera. Zoom shouldn't be, be the only teacher, and, and that's, that's quite true. Um, nice for class school community to connect with, with um, the teacher as a group. I think uh, I, I've seen a couple of things in schools where they're, they're doing really some social type events, leveraging some of these technologies that aren't your class per se, but it's something of a gathering point. We, so we're going to have a, a virtual happy hour three, uh, today with uh, <laughs> our staff and faculty. And it's a great, I mean, it's great for people to see each other yeah. and connect, you know. Well, maybe it's a little too early. Well, at least where I am in the, on the East Coast, you know, here is a little early for happy hour quite yet. But um, that that's a great example of how to you know bring people you're working with together and, and trying to do that. Um, this this idea of of sitting in front of a computer doing schoolwork all day long too, I think, has has some ramifications. And I think Stephanie's you know pointing that out a bit. Um, I, I think you you have to find that balance a little bit. I think we have great tools. But we should try and make that efficient as uh, that learning as efficient as possible, leveraging uh, the tools we have available to us, but then also encouraging people to get outside and do the things that they need to socially and, and physically. Yeah, um, you know, following up on Stephanie's point, I hope that yeah. K to 12 world is finding opportunities to make, um, you know, counseling resources available. That's right. That's right. Uh, Bob posts when classes get back to normal, you'll be trying to figure out. Uh, how to mute the kid in the back of the class. Yes, I know, uh, you know, fortunately here we could just mute away. Um, but yes, I think uh, it's a different type of classroom management going on in the world of Zoom and online than you have in person for sure. That, that's that's a, a good one. Um, any other quick final questions? I do want to, while, while I'm thanking Kelly here for his time today and um, joining us here in our virtual world. I'm uh, talking a little bit and trying to pass along some great information to people working to for themselves and to help others to take their traditional education experience and, and bring it online and uh, and really drive this in a way that it's going to be an, a successful experience for the learner and, and I think for the skill development of instructors at the end of the day. Um, any last thoughts there, uh, Kelly, before we, before we wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I think when uh, when things get back to whatever normal is going to be down the road, uh, that there's going to be some good takeaways that we're going to, you know, we're going to have learned some things, some tools, some techniques, some ideas, and um, and maybe to some extent this whole thing will, you know, speed up the pace of change where some change is needed in the world of education. So, uh, and hopefully we, you know, we're all just going to be a little, a little more patient, a little, a little nicer to each other, right? I would absolutely agree with that. And I think that um, I've already seen some rapid skill development that I think will, will remain long after this uh, with, with educators. And it's brought a lot of things to light that we didn't really have on the, the front burner for sure for a while. Yep. Um, and uh, let's see, the, this will mean the end of snow days. Yes, I know there's already been some schools who have instituted that where they do not miss school because of snow, because they uh, now do virtual or e-learning days, things like that, um, to continue the instruction. So, so sad for the kids. They, they don't get a complete day off. Uh, yeah, and, and college the teachers, too. But um, it, in our case, it, it uh, would, would mean that we would not have to make up so many days, perhaps in a school, uh, yeah. take, o take over spring break, things like that. So. Uh, anyway, I know it's about the end of our time here. Again, join us uh, next week. We're going to talk about uh, falling through the virtual crack, um, making sure that all of our learners, uh, one, can stay with us during this time. How do we do that? How do we address the needs, individual needs of students? And also with instructors, how do we keep the instructors engaged? One of the things Kelly mentioned was just being uh, very present in your online world. Um, I think we can't allow ourselves as teachers to throw, fall through that virtual uh, crack and kind of be um, absent uh, from, from the world of what needs to be going on in the class. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will hopefully see you next week. We'll be on at 1 o'clock on Friday, uh, the 24th. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take Thanks, care, Kelly. Everybody. Stay well.